This is Jason Belzer for Athletic Director U. Today I'm joined by head men's basketball coaches Rob Lanier of Georgia State and Josh Passner of Georgia Tech. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Jason. So we are here at the end of July, uh, just finished up with the first recruiting period in the, the new COVID world, uh, and also the new world of name, image, and likeness, which has certainly uh, transformed your jobs and the industry uh, pretty much upside its head uh, very quickly. And so I want to talk a little bit about how name, image, and likeness NIL has affected you guys so far, affected your teams, your student athletes, uh, as well as some of the other changes that the industry is undergoing. So specifically, NIL became a reality this past July. Uh, it came sooner than most of us thought it would. Uh, and now your student athletes have the opportunity to monetize their name, image, and likeness. Josh, let's start with you. What have you been communicating to your student athletes? What has your school done? And then what have you personally done? And I know that you've had a number of players uh, that have declared for the draft uh, and that NIL may be factored into their decision. Do I stay? Do I go? Can I maybe make more money while still in college or do I risk, you know, going into the draft and, and seeing how that plays out? Well, first off, Jason, you know, and you've given some presentations with, through the NABC and you, you've been on top of it you know, more than most of understanding it and um, with the NIL. And um, there's no doubt that the landscape has changed with with college basketball, uh, college sports in general, um, you know, for, for student athletes to have the opportunity to make money off their name, image and likeness. What's interesting um, and, and from my viewpoint, um, I actually think and, and not moving away from the NIL, I actually think the the Austin case decision by the Supreme Court's actually more impactful than the possible the NIL. I think eventually the NIL will kind of just even itself out. The market will be what the market is for, for individuals that that have the opportunity to make money off their name, image, likeness. And, and not that we have to spend time on it, but I think the Austin case really changes the dynamics because that's going to be more on the school or the institution based on what they view as an, an academic you know, expense uh, related to, you know, academic incentives for student athletes. And uh, as we know that the Supreme Court ruled that there's no, you know, cap or anything else. So that's going to be a difference because that's going to be more on the school, whereas the NIL is more on the on the young man or the young or, or the young woman. So um, we've given as much education as possible. We want our student athletes to make as much money as possible. Uh, but we've also let them know that you got to be at practice at this time and you've got to be do your job academically and be in class and study hall. Uh, but outside of those times, do, do, do as well as you can and, and hopefully they make as much money they can off their name and likeness. Rob? You know, uh, I think the effect that it's going to have on the entire landscape remains to be seen. You know, I think we're all kind of learning as we go. But what's most fascinating about it to me is that the NCAA for so long has convinced the general public that it's not okay for young people to have ownership of their identity. And as a result, it was like the fear of some change that's uh, ahead. I think change is inevitable. Uh, I think Josh and I are both young enough uh, to embrace the fact that we're gonna have to live with some change and adapt going forward old enough to appreciate the tradition of what we've uh, what brought us to this point. But uh, change is inevitable. I don't know how much it's going to affect us at the mid-major level. Uh, I've been on some major campuses with high profile guys, particularly in football. I was at Florida when Tebow was in college. I'm certain that it would have had a dramatic effect. And I think those schools with those type of individuals will have a more profound effect than it will at our level. So, Josh, you mentioned the Austin case and that giving schools, I would say maybe the best way to describe it is more ammo to recruit student athletes, to be able to potentially offer them uh, money if they reach a certain GPA or maybe say, we're going to pay for your graduate school if you come here. Rob, you mentioned how NIL may not affect you as much from a mid-major standpoint. What's interesting is that you guys are both coaching in the same city, different levels, obviously, mid-major versus a high major. Um, but how are you selling recruits on whether it's maybe this opportunity now with Alston, but also with NIL? I mean, in a lot of ways, are your playbooks similar? Come to Atlanta, 
being one of the major metropolitan business areas in the United States. There's tons of Fortune 500 companies. In fact, there are more companies in the city of Atlanta that spend money in college athletics than any other city, right? You have Coca-Cola, Chick-fil-A, Home Depot, Delta. Is that a selling point for you guys as coaches? I mean, you're out on the road recruiting. What are you telling these kids when it comes to NIL and their opportunity to come play at your institutions? I think it can become a selling point, and that's what I'm saying. It remains to be seen, but I think if you're at Georgia Tech, you're recruiting high-level students. Um, and young people, by and large, still want to play. Um, you know, we're basketball coaches. So I, I don't think young people who are going through the recruiting process just yet has fully wrapped their minds around what the opportunities really look like for them. So at the forefront of most young people's families, coaches, AAU coaches' minds is really what does the opportunity look like from a basketball standpoint? And if you find the right opportunity basketball-wise, then inside of that opportunity, they start to explore what NIL will mean for them, particularly, again, at our level. Um, maybe Josh will run into some situations where he's competing for <laughs> in a different way. But I, I think for us, young people still want to play. They still want to get an education. And that's really our main focus are those two things first. And we'll see how much things change in, as it relates to that. But I think those things still are at the forefront. And, and Coach Lanier said it perfectly. And, you, and you know, the other thing, Jason, is a lot of the opportunities for the NIL, um, a lot will be determined on do you produce during the season? I mean, are you playing well? And there might be some things happen during the course of the season. But a lot of it could be based on, you know, just on, on, on the social media aspect of your following, of how many followers you have as well, too. But I tell our guys, and to follow up what Coach Lanier said, um, you know, we, we, in Atlanta, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of Fortune 500 companies, businesses, but also to have to, to, to set the expectations to understand that, hey, look, you got the Atlanta Braves, you do have the Atlanta Hawks, you do have the, the Falcons. And if you look at those sports teams, only a few guys of each team are really only getting some opportunities or, or potential deals so to understand that you might come to atlanta and and maybe it's not the, the benefit of being here is not just about the short-term fix it's about the long term and who you can meet the doors that open the opportunities that exist when the when the air comes out of the ball and 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 as coach said you know the, the power of just beyond of, of basketball but again 99.9 percent .9 of the student athletes they want to know about like coach they want they want to have What's my playing time going to be like? Do I have an opportunity to get a lot to be in the rotation? You know, this, this, this. So it's still a lot of focus is still about the opportunities on basketball um, and opportunities there. I do still think, you know, there's going to be, as I've mentioned earlier, I just think the market will even itself out. And the ones who have the opportunity to, 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 to be able to capitalize on their name, image, likeness, they're going to be able to do it. I just think it'll be different in some different areas. I mean, look at the quarterback at Alabama. He hasn't even played a game, and he's, uh, per coach Nick Saban, he's going to make a lot of money. I just think there's going to be certain people like that. That There's a gymnast here or there, or uh, I know a softball player here or there, or the women's basketball players at Fresno State. And so, but it's, I don't know if it's going to be a wide range where just every person's going to have the opportunity to make the money sure. that's going to change, that's going to be life altering. Well, so it's interesting you bring up the, the quarterback at Alabama and there's been a lot of controversy because people are saying, how is a kid that hasn't played a down yet and isn't even the highest rated recruit in his class already making a million dollars? People are skeptical. Others are saying, well, he's going to play for Alabama and Nick Saban. And just because of that, how does that work? You guys have been put in a very precarious position as coaches, right? Because you can't Technically, by the rules, you can't help your student athlete generate money, right? You can't say, hey, I can help you go get an endorsement deal. What you can do is maybe make them the best possible athlete in order for them to increase their stock, maybe help their social media following and all of those things. What's interesting, though, is that, and, and you mentioned Haley and Hannah Cavan there at Fresno State, they're good basketball players, not great basketball players, but they are fantastic social media stars. Right. And that's one of the reasons why they have been able to capitalize on NIL in a unique way, as opposed to maybe the next WNBA first round pick. Right. How do you balance that as coaches? First of all, how do you balance assisting your players and getting them opportunities? And then secondly, um, what if you have a player who, you know, is not necessarily going to be the star of your team, but they're a really good, you know, TikTok dancer? 
there, there's a girl that plays for South Alabama. She has over 2 million followers on social media. She does food reviews. She eats hamburgers and they pay her $20,000 a month. And that's an interesting thing because, you know, she has to come to practice and do her thing. But at the same time, if she's going to go make $20,000 to do a food review of a, of a McDonald's hamburger, her priorities may not be straight. How, how do you manage that? Because it, it's different also, I think, because in the professional world, pro athletes are getting paid. They're getting a salary. So they know I got to show up to work or I don't get paid. Here, it's a little bit different, right? The kid's saying, hey, do I go make some money doing an endorsement deal or do I actually go and do what I need to do to be successful and play in the system? Well, you had, Jason, you had mentioned this on the talk at the NABC going through the NIL, um, that it's really important for the head coach or the coaches, but especially for the head coach, not to get into the avenue of promising or you take out the rules for a second, just even giving the, 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 the impression that they could get something coming to the school as in terms of a possible NIL deal because of a potential down the road of a, in this day and age, you could possibly get sued for something sure. like that. And you had mentioned that on the, on, on the call. And so um, my, my stance and to, to, like you said, with, with the young lady at South Alabama, my stance is I told our guys, I said, look, I hope you, and, and I met with them before July 1st came and went, in, went into effect with the NIL. I said, I hope you all can make a million dollars each and make 10 million and 20, make as much money as you can. However, I'm the head coach and I can't get into the middle of, of between, I don't want Jimmy Joe thinking that I'm playing Johnny because he has a better deal and I got to make sure to take care of the deal. But in the end, or Johnny's mad at me because he does have a good deal and he's not playing well and I put him on the bench and I play Jimmy instead. And then all of a sudden there becomes a problem. So I told the guys, I'm staying out of it. We'll give you the education, but I'm going to be far removed from it. And just know that you're required to be at our times of practice. You've got to do your job academically. And then when, when we're not in athletically or academic related activities that are required by Georgia Tech, do what you got to do. You've got your time to do that. And, um, and to follow your advice, what you said, that way you stay out of it and don't get into the mix. But I think that could be more of the issue is player A feels you're favoring player B because player B might have a better deal. Or if you, player B has a good deal and he doesn't play as well, that he gets upset and then becomes a, a, a team dynamic problem. So I think trying to get as much education, but also be as, as much removed as you can so you don't get in those possible issues. Bob, do you agree with that, that it's better to just stay out of it completely? I mean, the, the scenario that we have posed before was, you know, player comes to you, says, I just got this endorsement deal, and you say, I, I'm not starting anymore. They're going to pull that deal, and I'm using that money to help pay my parents' mortgage. What do you tell him? What do you say? And if he threatens that he's going to leave and transfer elsewhere, I mean, how do you, that, that's an entirely new dynamic that all of a sudden you might have to start managing. And that, you know, talk about amateurism. How, how does that all play into it? Well, that scenario that you just painted, he's going to have to find a new school. But I, I would say that in general, uh, your original question, it's an extension of our job. And my job, I believe, is as a teacher. And what we try to teach our group is responsibility. And so in order to be a pro, which most of these guys say they want to be a pro, one of the things you have to master that I think all pros have to do is being able to compartmentalize. Uh, there's so many things coming at guys, the best players in the world. So many different people want their time. So many people want their money. And they have to find a way to prioritize and compartmentalize those things and still take care of their responsibilities on the court and in the classroom. So this is just another thing that's being thrown at them. So they might have to take some of their time away from video games to invest in this. But to, to Josh's point, it's not going to take away from the responsibilities that you have in our program. And if it compromises what, what, we, what we're doing, like you're saying with this young man, then we'll probably have to help that young man find a situation that's more conducive to what he's got going on. But we're not going to compromise our standards as a program to accommodate these things. But we are going to try to tr educate young people on how to make the most of their time and to use this as one more thing that they have to compartmentalize and prioritize and still take care of their responsibilities. I, I don't think it's that complicated, really. Um, unless these situations you're 
you know, I think that's a unique situation that could come up maybe at Josh's place that we won't have to worry about. But by and large, I think if you just work with people and you're in their corner and you educate them and everybody's honest and open with one another, you can work through a lot of things. So you earlier on mentioned uh, empowerment and what we've seen really over the last 18 months is uh, an incredible amount of empowerment to the student athlete. Obviously, the Alston case, we have NIL. We now have essentially free agency uh, as, as part of the transfer portal. Uh, everything that happened last year with social justice and George Floyd. How has that changed the way that you guys coach? You talk about being young enough to appreciate and be adaptable, but also old enough to remember the good old days and how things were when we played in college and the limitations that we had to kind of stay and focus. How do you, on a day-to-day, -day, manage your student athletes and make sure that they understand um, what's, what they're there for, which is obviously first and foremost to get an education, to play athletics, and hopefully to gain certain skills that they can be successful further in life. And how do, how do you manage that with all of these new distractions and opportunities and empowerments that they have? Well, you know, I, I know Josh is good at this. Um, what we try to do is, and I think this is important in any program and any business, anything you're doing is that it's about relationships and all relationships function positively when there's trust. And, you know, so, responsibility to the young people is to operate in their best interests. And the trust is what allows them to realize and know and embrace the fact that we are doing that. That is where we're coming from. And if they don't trust you, whatever advice or guidance that you might be trying to give is not going to be well received. And I think it's important for young people to know that you love them, you care about them, you're operating in their best interests. And when you have the right answers, give them. And when you don't know, help them find the right answers. Um, and again, going back to my earlier point about prioritizing and, uh, you know, the big thing is for kids, like we want guys in basketball that are hoopers. We want guys that are competitive, that want to win, that want to be great at the game. But we also want those young people to care enough about their future that they're focused on academics and want to get an education. So if that is the pool of people that you're recruiting from, you can handle all of these other things and you can build that trust that I'm talking about. Yeah, and and Coach Lanier made a mention of, he used the word love about, you know, you love it on your players. And if you haven't seen his teams, I mean, his teams play so hard, you can tell um, that th his players love them and, they, and how hard they play. Um, and that's a direct reflection. And I think that's really important, as, as Coach had mentioned even earlier, that being willing to adapt and change like it, you, you, you as a head coach you have to be willing to adapt and change and be flexible in this day and age you you just otherwise you're going to get left behind you can sit and complain and and uh, but the train has left the station on a lot of things and it, like the transfer portal i mean you can complain about it but it's gone i mean it's the, the, that's how it is moving forward so um i think all those things are 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 really important uh, to continue to, to 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 just be willing to change and be inflexible and 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 continue to to listen to the student athletes. Um, you know, I was really proud of you know I thought uh, you know with Georgia Tech and kind of with our team there was a a great initiative with the, with the get out and vote that kind of you know was was really sprung from from Georgia Tech and 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 it kind of took its uh, um, you know path of its own where the NC two A now get, you're forced to give all student athletes on day off on on days uh, on voting days uh which is a great thing because and and it gives uh the student athletes an opportunity now to vote and, and and to really get educated and do all that thing and that was a real cool thing from from georgia tech and it, which kind of again like i said took it took a life of its own in a real positive direction and so those type of things uh had come from opportunities from listening to student athletes and then uh being able to make some changes and 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 being flexible and uh, i just think as the the game continues to change. And I really think, as we mentioned about the Austin case, you're going to have to continue to be really flexible and adaptable and, and just this is kind of the new age of things and how it's moving, moving forward. So it sounds like with all of these distractions, there is also opportunity if you can channel the student athlete's energy towards doing good, right? Whether it's get out the vote initiative or whatever it is. Uh, 
final questions, uh, put you guys on the spot. Let's imagine that we're sitting here 10 years from now and you have to give yourself some advice on how to manage the next 10 years. I would love to hear because of this new day and age that we're in, what advice do you have for yourselves? Or maybe you can give it to one another. What advice do you have for yourselves, for other coaches in the industry with everything that's happened and all the changes? What would you say to yourselves to make sure that you guys, yourselves remain focused and get your student athletes on the same page? Uh, put the student athletes first and remain open-minded because change is coming. It's inevitable. Uh, in every industry, in every facet of life, uh, you know, somebody was asking me the other day about uh, selfies when I was you know, asking me, did you used to do selfies? I was like, there was no smartphones. <laughs> you know, the world is, is ever evolving. And so is our sport. And so is the game. And maybe the role of the NCAA plays in all of this may change as a result of what we're seeing. Whatever lies ahead, remain open-minded. Put uh, the student athletes first. Um, and if you remain a teacher and that's your disposition, you'll be able to adapt to whatever lies ahead. I would say, um, you know, it, about as elementary as this sounds, but really about take it one day at a time, because really that's what it is. I mean, to start trying to predict how the future is going to be and get yourself worried about the possible scenarios, you know, you're going to just end up driving yourself crazy. So really just, you know, one day at a time, uh, and trying to stay locked in as the present on 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 what's going on because there is a lot of change. And I mean, as we see now with the possible schools moving to different conferences, there could be another realignment shift, and just nobody knows. And so it's a lot of it's just speculation and uh, trying to predict the future probably just causes you undue stress. So just trying to keep it in the moment and just one day at a time. Sure, well, that's some great advice. And Josh, to, you, to your final point, I feel like college athletics is is that famous Yogi Berra quote, "Deja vu all over again." It's like we have the same conversation every five to ten years, and yet here we are. We've survived, and hopefully, we can survive the next decade. So, Coach Passner, Coach Lanier, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.